I think uh, part of our profession has gotten so hyper focused on change as negative, disruptors as bad. Uh, I don't see it that way. Uh, I just see them simply as a buyer who's out there buying real estate and our clients may need to know about it. And there's still a role for us to serve in taking care of our clients' best interest. You're listening to The Real Estate Sessions. I'm your host, Bill Risser, with Fidelity National Title, Tampa District. Thanks for tuning in as we uncover the stories of leaders in our industry. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 222 of The Real Estate Set, Room 222. I love that. From The Real Estate Sessions podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for telling a friend. I am staying local in Tampa today. Uh, we've done a lot of traveling around the country with the guests recently, but uh, I'm here in Tampa Palms. I'm on Bruce B. Downs. Now, for those of you who are in the Tampa area, you know the road well. It's one of the widest like non-freeways I've ever been on in my life. And if you watch the news, they're always talking about Bruce B. Downs. And so I'm here over in North Tampa, uh, and I'm here to talk to Doug Lloyd. Doug Lloyd is the owner broker of Florida Executive Realty, coming up on 30 years with this brokerage here in Tampa. And I can't wait to get Doug's story, the brokerage story. Doug, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Bill, for having me. It's a fun opportunity to share with you and uh, share with some of your listeners what's going on here in Tampa Bay. First, I know you're from Dayton, Ohio, right? I did a little dig in, a little research, and we've had a conversation before. I'd love to hear from you. Um, tell me more about Dayton. What is Dayton? Now, I got to be honest. All I really know is about the Flyers. They're always in the tournament in March, right? The- <laughs> well, uh, not quite always in the tournament, but uh, <laughs> certainly the Dayton Flyers are a big part of that town. It's a, a Midwestern town, southwestern Ohio, about an hour from Cincinnati, about an hour from Columbus, um, and from... From my perspective, a great place to grow up. I lived there uh, until I was 30. Uh, and then one particular event that you may ask me about <laughs> uh, changed my mind about where I was going to stay. Uh, but it's a good town, town of about a million in the metro area. So it's not a small city. Right. Um, but those flyers you ask about, <laughs> now they happen to be in the top 20 right now in college basketball and a pretty heady 13 and 2. So this March, you should watch out for the Dayton Flyers. Right. Hopefully, you'll be rooting them along with me. I'll write that tip down. I also know that if I was to happen to say OH in front of you. I would say I owe. Okay, so you, <laughs> let's talk about the Buckeyes. Are you, you're, you're an actual, you're a proud Buckeye yourself? I am. Uh, you're, you're living in Dayton. You're about an hour from Columbus. Was, was going to Ohio State always kind of in your mind? Or when, did that, when did that happen? No, I don't know that I could say it was always in my mind, but uh, the high school I went to, uh, our colors were scarlet and gray. <laughs> All right. Uh, and our fight song was the Ohio State fight song. And it seemed to have a certain, that's where you're supposed to go, quality to it. Um, that's a, it's a terrific school, uh, a little pretentious with the Ohio State University at times. Um, and uh, But it was a great uh, city. Columbus is the capital of Ohio. Everything there revolves at one level or another around Ohio State University. So it's a good place to go. I'm thinking, are you in the Woody Hayes days? I am indeed. When I went there, wow. Woody was the coach. Yeah. Uh, the uh, quarterback was Cornelius Green. Okay. And the uh, only two-time Heisman Trophy winner, Archie Griffin, yeah. was our running back at the wow. time. So just like now, they've, they've maintained a very consistent excellence over the decades yeah. uh, in playing a very high level of football. Uh, especially on those certain Saturdays in November <laughs> when they have a chance to play the University of the School up north. I was going to say, I knew that was coming out. You, <laughs> no one, no Buckeye will ever say the word, right? It I was, love it. It's just the school up north. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> I love that. So you go to Ohio State. Was real estate on your mind at that time? When you got out of school, were you thinking, I'm going to be a realtor? Uh, not at all, Yeah, actually. Um, I'm not sure that there was anything real focused other than I – Thought I might want to be a lawyer. Um, And so when I went to school, that was in my mind to become a lawyer eventually. Um, Somewhere along the line, uh, I met a couple of lawyers and decided maybe that wasn't what I was supposed to do. (laughs) No offense. No, no, Uh, yeah, no uh, offense. None none meant, don't don't take any, all of our (laughs) counselor friends out there. Exactly. But I ended up back in Dayton at Wright State University, which at the time was a very new university in Dayton. Uh, It's grown tremendously over the decades itself Uh, and ended up in the uh, floor covering business working for a company called Color Tile. 
Okay. Which at that time was owned by Tandy Corporation, which owned Radio Shack right. and Ooh. a number of other companies. Yeah. And on a very high growth curve. And at 21 years of age, I was managing one of their stores and then eventually ended up in Indianapolis briefly. Wow. Uh, before I was summarily dismissed. And that particular moment was when the real estate uh, business came into my mind. Color Tile was largely a do-it-yourself store. Um, and so we sold and helped people understand how to put floor tile and wall tile. And so most of our customers at that store had either just bought their house or uh, were planning on selling their house and right. were fixing it up. And so often that was part of our conversations with them. And so when I was no longer employed there uh, and didn't uh, want to suffer through that uh, again, I decided maybe being my own boss, so to speak, that lure of yeah. the real estate business, I'm going to make my own schedule by golly. Uh, seemed like an appropriate, uh, move. And that was 1980. Okay. And so in 1980, I got my license and, and maybe I'll share a little bit more what happened next here <laughs> before we're done. Cause it kind of goes, it kind of goes to this business to some degree. And maybe some of those who, uh, are listening to this podcast and, and hearing, uh, maybe some of what 40 years in this business has taught me, right. how it might apply to them today. Yeah, we definitely want to get there. Do you go back to Dayton as a realtor then? So I went uh, to Dayton. I ultimately got, that's where I was when I got my license. Okay. Um, I was there for uh, seven more years before one particular wintertime storm. Now, look, you've told me this story. Continue, please. Okay. Well, it was one particular rainy sleety freezing cold day in Dayton Ohio and sad to say my car was outside and so in the morning when I left for work I had to go scrape the ice off my windshield drove to work on slippery roads stayed at work all day mostly because it was too dangerous to drive but when it was time to go home I had to went back out to the parking lot scraped the ice off my windows again and as I ended up uh, driving home I had a relatively long driveway with a a bit of an uphill uh, slant to it. And I got stuck in my own driveway. Um, as I was stuck in my driveway, I was kind of looking around and I noticed the foundation shrubs for those uh, who were up. Some have evergreen shrubs in Ohio, right? Um, and they were so bent over with snow, I was concerned that the branches would break. And in the springtime, I'd have these unsightly holes in my hedge. Um, and so much to my surprise, about 15 minutes later, I'm standing in my front yard with a rake in my hand, raking my bushes and somewhere along the third or fourth bush, it hit me that first of all, this is ridiculous. I'm raking my bushes, dropped the rake in the front yard and went in back into the house and asked my wife if she was ready to move to Florida. And she would tell you. She was always been a Floridian. She was just born in the wrong state because she's yeah. also from Ohio. Okay. And uh, that was 86. And I said, no more winners for me. Like many of our clients, customers, and friends and people we know here that said that same or something similar to it. Yeah. Uh, and so by uh, Labor Day of the next year, 87, we were living in Tampa. Wow. Um, certainly never regretted that one. So you come down here, have to start up fresh. Right, you left your entire sphere and your database and everything back in Dayton. Um, talk about how you handled, you know, kind of that transition into a, a new area as a realtor. Well, the the opportunity here was obviously big. I remember at that time thinking uh, that if you um, could see a uh, the Tampa Bay business environment, this is from an outsider's point of view. This mm -hmm. guy's moving from Dayton, Ohio, where things are pretty slow moving. City fathers always thinking of one way or another to get something started. And then to come down here and it was like the, if, if the business was a pot of boiling water, wow. it was boiling over the edges. And I thought, man, this is a place where a guy like me, a new guy, they need some help. Uh, and even though I had no geographic familiarity, really none, uh, and, uh, Carmea, my wife and I didn't really know anybody, this seemed like the right town to be in. And um, so I very quickly ended up here in Tampa Palms in this same building we're in now, working for the developer of a master plan community, which I did for about three years until uh, the last recession before the Great Recession was the uh, savings and loan crisis. Some of your older listeners might yeah. remember. 
Yeah. And the Resolution Trust Corporation. The late eighties kind of action. Late eighties, early nineties. And so, uh, that, um, uh, led to a chain of events that ended up with me starting Florida Executive Realty in 1992. Wow. Uh, which I'd love to tell you was a grand plan, <laughs> but honestly, it was just a matter of circumstance just kind of worked out that way. And so it's, but it's worked out pretty well. I, I love the fact that we are in, I'm going to guess this was either the Welcome Center or Sales Center Correct. for Tampa Palms. It was called the Information Center. Here. Information same, Center. Same idea, yes. And so you bought this building yes. and said, I'm going to put my company here. I'm well, just going to guess, you probably still know people in Tampa Palms. You may have helped back in oh, the day. Oh, very much so. <laughs> so this, you do very well here in this this area. Yeah, we, we would have dominant market share in this community with certainty. Yeah. Uh, and it's a big community. It's about 7,000 acres and almost wow. 20,000 people living here. So um, it's pretty substantial in that regard. And most of my agents either live themselves here in Tampa Palms or within 10 minutes one way or the other. Yeah. And so we have a pretty strong presence. We've been involved in the community in every conceivable way yeah. uh, since we started by way of living, working, and playing here. We were engaged and involved. I was going to say that's like what everyone's being told to do today in 2020, right? Is get local, get get connected to your community, be a part of what's happening. You've been doing it for nearly three decades. Indeed. Well, it it is real estate is obviously local by its very nature, yeah. right? And yeah. given the fact that it's also very personal, right? When you put those two together, that's why advice today is sound advice, and it was good back then. I'm not sure anybody was out there yelling about it, but uh, <laughs> I don't think so. It seemed kind of obvious to me. Thinking about it, as a business owner since 1992, I mean, you have seen some amazing changes over your nearly three decades as an owner, right? I mean, think about, first of all, the internet really becoming a thing, not just something that had bulletin boards on it, but a real thing, or actually having websites for agents. And then and then here comes Web 2.0 with social media and, and all these other things. And, and then you even have the recession, right? That we talked about the dark days, 2007 to 11, let's say. Thinking back on those things, were you always kind of watching out for what was happening and looking to take advantage. You know, how do I, how am I going to leverage this new thing that's coming into our business? And that's got to be a part of what you do today, right? You're paying attention to what's happening so you can be a part of that. So talk about as a business owner, how do you, how do you anticipate those things? How do you prepare and then how do you execute? I know that's a big, broad question, but I'll let you take that. Well, it's certainly a, a, a big question, but well, I think the, the easy answer to it is uh, that you need to be paying attention. Yeah. Um, and staying at the forefront of what's happening, listening and talking with your colleagues around the country. One of the things that hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about is our membership and leading real estate companies of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that's come out of that particular affiliation uh, is my membership in two separate CEO groups. One of them, we travel around to each other's company around the country, and we just uh, celebrated our 15th year of doing that. Yeah. Um, and another one is a... Um, I have a brainstorming group that actually comes to Tampa. They'll actually be here tomorrow afternoon. Wow. So I've got 20 brokers coming to Tampa tomorrow and uh, Wednesday, and we'll do a roundtable session for a day and a half. And there's certainly social involved and because it is personal, uh, but as fellow business owners and brokers from around the country, their input, their insight, uh, what they see and share and how they've dealt with it, either proactively or reactively and learn their lesson. Um, to get that kind of regular input bill, I've told those people in that group, you've made me a better broker and you made me a better businessman at the same time. Wow. Yeah. Those networks, right. They're everything. Well, you know, it's a, it's a relocation and referral network. I mean, that's the, that's the essence of it. Um, but I think I, it's not an overstatement to say that the price of admission is fully fulfilled by my ability to have fellow brokers in that network who are willing to open, talk to you, yeah. share with you lay out what they've done and not done uh, and an effort to make you better at what you do. That's, that's pretty hard to find. Uh, and it's allowed me, and it goes to your question, I believe yeah. uh, to continue to look forward and have other people looking with me or, or giving me an elbow and say, Hey, it's next to you, right? You got to turn and look that way. You're right. Uh, but all of those changes, um, you know, the tech driven changes, um, I, I've been around long enough where the computer was not part of what we did <laughs> At all. Right. I remember sometime in the mid eighties and I was in a real estate. I was already a broker at that time. Uh, and my wife who was in the jewelry business at the time, 
she'd come home occasionally and say something about, well, like we faxed this or we faxed that. And, you know, I wanted to be cool and act like I knew what she was talking about. But finally, curiosity got the best of me. And I said, what, what did you say? You faxed something? What, what is that? And so she told me this magical story about a, a machine with printer wheels on it where you stick it in the top and a phone's connected to two little rubber cups. And pretty soon it recreates that document somewhere else on planet Earth. And I go, no way. <laughs> and from that somewhat um, modest start in technology, uh, every technological change that we can currently imagine is already here. The thing is, what will be here a week from now, six months from now, five years from now in technology is beyond some of our ability to comprehend. Right. But it doesn't mean you can't prepare for it and be ready to adopt, adapt, or adjust. And uh, those three watchwords for me uh, are pretty important as a, as a business owner. Um, you know, adjusting is more of a, a temporary movement. Adapting uh, is taking some better process, some better products, some better tool, and actually integrating it. And adopting is just full out going the other way, right? Yeah. It yeah. is taking full ownership of something that you hadn't done before. Right. So with that input to me from colleagues around the country um, and uh, uh, being mindful about changes and embracing them rather than being fearful of them, if you got no change, you got no progress. And so it's easy enough for me to embrace and uh, actually look forward to it. Yeah. I'm going to guess it's not hard to get those people to come to Tampa every January. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, curious enough, the uh, first time we, this is about 15 years for this group also. Wow. And uh, it was at one of our national conferences and they said, wouldn't it be cool if we had a, a group somewhere around the country that we could meet sometime in early part of the year, right? A little business planning. Yeah, we'll sure. get on the right page and. I said, well, I'm, I think that's a great idea. I'm in. And uh, a couple, well, where would we do it? And I said, Tampa, Florida is nice in January. <laughs> and about 10 or 12 people said, yeah. And uh, so we got here that next year. They showed, showed up, sure enough. And at the end of the meeting, I said, well, I'd love to do this again. And they go, yeah, us too. We'll see you next year. And I said, well, where are we going to do it? I said, right here. <laughs> and so 15 years later, Still in, Still in Tampa. It's never been any place else. That's awesome. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a pretty nice place to visit in yeah. wintertime. I want to go back to your technology Certainly. conversation a bit there. Um, personally, I know Anthony Malafronte very well, one of your agents. Yes. And, uh, Terrific and agent. My Tampa agent is his team. Uh, in fact, he's the one that suggested I talk to you, right? And so, and I know he uses technology very effectively. And so, but I also know because of conversations that I've had with you, we just talked about it here. Relationships are everything, right? So talk about that nexus of technology and relationships, right? Because they're both very necessary. And sometimes they can work against each other. Like, it's really important to make sure that the technology is serving those relationships, right? Absolutely. One of the parts of our onboarding process when we bring a new agent to Florida Executive Realty is a two-part session called the ComTech meeting. And... Um, Com for communication, obviously, and tech for technology. And uh, it's certainly not called a tech com meeting. And while that might just be a clever turn of the word, the point is that communication is what we're trying to be good at because communication is all about relationship building and communicating effectively and well and at the right frequency and the right tone. Um, and technology of various kinds is a tool to do that. Uh, one's strategic and the other one's tactical. And the tools are the tactical. The tech is the tactical, right? The desire to build relationships and a business built on relationships um, is the key. And that's where one of the places that Anthony and my Tampa agent do a great job is using the technology to communicate effectively. Yeah. And can they work against each other? Well, there's no question that that's true. Yeah. You know, sometimes uh, if, if a good businessman or woman does a SWOT analysis of their company, little strengths and weaknesses, yeah. opportunities and threats, some of those strengths can often become and have inherently in them the seeds of weakness. So a company that said, hey, we are all tech all the time and we are good at it and we have the most the coolest gee whiz stuff around. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. But to the degree that it inhibits personal level communications and relationship building, 
your strength might have just become the weakness, right? Right. On the other hand, somebody that says, ah, you know what, if I can't see them face to face, we just don't do business with them, right? Uh, it kind of went too far the other way at the same time. Right. And so, yeah, embracing the two and putting them together, not only do we have a, a, a program for that early on to get our agents in that right frame of mind, um, but the tools as they continue to adopt and or continue to uh, evolve, I should say, mm-hmm. into ever more effective if you use them correctly, right? right. Uh, tools is good as long as you don't forget what you're trying to do, yeah. and that is to communicate, to build relationships. Love that phrase, build relationships. That's awesome. I love it when I hear a broker owner saying that. So you you have a heavy presence in Hillsborough County, right? For the people local that are listening, right? You're you're we're here at uh, in your office in Tampa Palms. I know at Carrollwood you have a huge presence. West Chase, Fishhawk, Winthrop, I think, Valrico, you yeah. know, a lot of that you've got that covered. I live in Pinellas. And so I'm always curious, are you ever thinking about Pinellas? And also, man, you got Pasco County to the north of you, which is booming. So you know, as you look, and I think you've been very deliberate in how you grow your company, and I don't know if you can share things or not, but I'm going to put you on the spot. Is is that something you're thinking about, like looking at some of these other areas? Well, I think the question for me is always one of quality. Yeah. Um, there's two ways to approach maybe all businesses, but certainly this one. One is the qualitative approach, and the other one is the quantitative approach. More is better. Um, and I came up with a little quote here that that kind of resonates with me. And that is that, uh, too big. However you define too big is the nemesis of good and Mm. the mortal enemy of excellence. Mm. And I think in that thought, uh, is part of the answers to your question. Certainly Pinellas County is, um, a huge market. I have uh, probably 10 agents that live in Pinellas County and choose to affiliate with us, even though we're primarily in Hillsborough. Yeah. At least our offices are all in Hillsborough. Our northernmost office, where we're sitting today, we're only about 10 minutes from the Pasco County line. So the southeastern Pasco area, right, of Wesley Chapel primarily. Sure. Yeah. But even farther, Zephyr Hills and other areas that are around here, all within 10 or 15 minutes of where we're sitting. Right. Our West Chase office is our most westernmost office. Uh, so that office is within 10 minutes of the Pinellas County line. Right. Um, so we already have access by way of two of our offices kind of on the edges of Hillsborough County. And as we look forward is actually having an office in the uh, 54, 56 uh, corridor all the way over to the Sun Coast. Makes sense. Probably. Yeah. Uh, does it make sense to have something in mid Pinellas to serve uh, Dunedin and areas like that? Palm Harbor. And obviously in St. Pete is uh, pretty attractive, right? Yeah. I'm a little partial to St. Yeah, Pete. Yeah. yeah I understand. <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. So here's the, here's the thought. If, if someday Florida Executive Realty has seven off, we currently have six, but if someday we have seven or eight or 10 and some of those are in Pasco and Pinellas County and instead of having a 200 agents and staff that we currently have, we have 250 or 300, mm-hmm. that would all be well and good. As long as I didn't lose my way and start to grow the company for the sake of getting bigger. Yeah. Because that's where we go to quantitative and leave qualitative. And that's where I don't want to go. You don't want to lose the excellence. I don't want to lose the excellence. That's That's why I do what I do. That's great. I love talking to leaders in the industry about some of the recent doings that are going on. And I think you know where I'm going. We've got the I buyers, right? The disruptors. I'll use the D word. So whether it's, uh, offer pad or open door or it's Zillow instant offers. And now all the big boys, the Realogy and, and, and Cole, uh, Keller Williams doing their own eye buying programs. What's your take on what that's doing? Is it, does it make you nervous? Do you look at it as, ah, it's just another change in the industry. We went through lots of changes. Uh, it does not make me nervous at all. I would see the, the eye buyer evolution from, you know, the snipe signs we see on the corners and, uh, we buy ugly houses, caveman guy. Right. To what's always been a local investor group who's always been there mm-hmm. to take up value where they have value added. They're interested, right? Right. Um, so here you just have much better funded, much higher marketing profile. But at the end of the day, they're a buyer. And when we represent sellers and they're a cash buyer, I'm interested in talking to them. And there's a, there's a clear role 
I think uh, part of our profession has gotten so hyper focused on change as negative, disruptors as bad. Uh, I don't see it that way. Uh, I just see them simply as a buyer who's out there buying real estate and our clients may need to know about it. And there's still a role for us to serve and taking care of our client's best interest. Right. When an eye buyer who I think you and I could agree, and I think most of our listeners would agree, um, what amounts to a professional buyer? It's what they do. Yeah. So here you have a eye buyer group, whether it's open door or offer pad or Zillow as a professional buyer trying to directly do business with an amateur seller. That's a pretty good recipe for the seller to lose. Absolutely. And so I would see our familiarity and our role as being even more important for our sellers to know that that might be an option. They don't buy in every price range. They don't buy in every area. But where they are active, the buyers I'm referring to, yeah, I'd want to make sure our sellers knew what the deal was. And if you guys are willing to make an offer, put it in, put it on writing. Let's see it. Yeah. Sit and do the math on it and decide whether it's worth taking. Sit and do the math. That's the critical do thing. The math. Right? It, all, it all comes down to time, right? It's like if I got to get out in a week or two, I, I'll do something different than I wouldn't do if I'm ready to wait 90 days. For certain sellers and uh, maybe for convenience, for certainty, uh, maybe a good example would be somebody uh, that inherited a property. Mm. Maybe the parents uh, left it to them in a will, and all of a sudden, they got mom and dad's house here in Tampa, and their kids are spread all over the country. And the reality of coming to Tampa and having a meeting of the minds with all three and maybe doing the work, the right. cleanup, the fix-up, the get it ready, um, and then wait for months and deal with all that, as opposed to take twenty or $30,000 less and be done with it in two weeks, that can be very attractive. Convenience has its value. Yeah. That's true. Uh, and where that value and convenience is more than the dollars, that's where I buyers might just have a place in our market. And some of them will survive. I don't believe all of them will. Right. And since you ask me if it's okay if I elaborate sure. just for a minute, yeah. some of my broker colleagues, um, KW and CB in particular, Cole Banker, have announced, and I'm assuming others as well, their own iBuyer programs. And it's just kind of curious. One of the things that Florida Executive Realty is a, one of our guiding philosophical lights is that our clients come first and our commissions come second. So it strikes me as odd that a brokerage company who would have a seller client and then suggest to them that they are the buyer. And all of a sudden your ability to represent a seller when you are the buyer seems like commission first and client second. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's their intention. You know, just have a naturally opposed position when I'm representing you to find the buyer or am I the buyer? Kind of a weird twist on dual agency. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought about it in that way, but uh, and of course agency related laws are different all over the country. But, sure. But yeah, it, it, when did you... St- Stop representing them and start representing yeah. yourself. Yeah. The moment you became the buyer. Yeah. That's yeah. why it's disclosed everywhere in every state. <laughs> if you're an agent when you're buying property, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and so it'd be interesting. Our, our take on that uh, is that instead of having an in-house or some kind of uh, relationship that we could strike with a funding source of some kind uh, to actually purchase the houses and then have only one source for our sellers who might want that option, I would rather stay independent just like I am and shop them all. Yeah. I love Cause that. now I'm not the buyer looking out for my own pocketbook. I'm still got my client first. Yeah. And so that's our approach to it. So I'm not afraid at all. As an independent, you have affiliated with a couple of different organizations. You mentioned leading real estate companies, but there's also LPI, right? Well, actually uh, luxury portfolio international is part of leading real oh, estate companies yeah, in the world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, there's actually another one. It's called uh, the MOM program. It's an acronym for Military on the Move. Um, there was some big news recently where USAA, which is for a long time, had a uh, affinity program via uh, the Realogy companies. Uh, and the USAA decided uh, that they were done. And so that would have been probably in the last 60 days. And so our military on the move program, our mom program is part of leading real estate companies in the world. And luxury portfolio international is our marketing program, print, 
and web based uh, for a million dollars out product all over the world. Wow. So very effective. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome for, like you said, for the independents, right? That don't have some of the, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, size <laughs> and infrastructure, right? Of the big, big box brands. Well, you know, when you're, when you're in a listing presentation and, and we know that real estate's a local business yeah. and it's a personal business, I mean, it's a, it's a transaction that is infrequent mm-hmm. for clients, be they buyers or sellers. It's unique. Um, it's expensive. It's full of emotion and it's complex. Yeah. And so having a advisor, a consultant, somebody that actually puts your interest before their own and understands it well enough to be a proper advisor, uh, that's pretty important. But when even in that being said, and a seller is thinking about, well, yeah, but how am I going to reach the, the international market? You're a nice local company, Florida Executive Realty, but what about the rest of Florida or the rest of the U.S. or you know, the rest of planet Earth? Um, and that's where leading real estate companies of the world brings us tools and programs and marketing very real to drive our property, our clients' properties all over the world uh, in their own currencies, in their own language, right. in a way that it's an effective marketing tool. So if what you're looking for as a seller is a local, personal flavor and knowledge and a global reach, uh, our, our tagline is we're local and we're global, both. Uh, and that's an LRE slogan, which is very effective and accurate. Let's do a little prognosticating, Doug. You ready? I'm ready. All right. What do you see going forward? In the, are we going to have the roaring 20s here in the Tampa market? What do you see? Well, I, the, the roaring 20s, uh, I'm not that old, Bill. <laughs> Me I'm pe- neither. Some people, okay. some people thinking, was he alive back then? <laughs> No, not quite that old, but uh, the Roaring Twenties was uh, indeed roaring until it wasn't. Right. Uh, October of 29, as my history lessons teach me, was a uh, was an ugly day. Yep. And uh, the, most of the decade that followed it was the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I hesitate to root for something that ended so badly last time. Um, on the other hand, uh, it would appear. Remember that pot of boiling water I talked about earlier? Yeah. The curious part about that is as much as 1987's pot of boiling water to this Dayton, Ohio boy looked like it was boiling over and opportunities everywhere. I would tell you the 2020 pot of boiling water for Tampa Bay is boiling even more and the pot's bigger. Wow. And uh, so I would see something akin to the roaring 20s in terms of activity, uh, growth. I think We'll We'll call it version 2.0 though. Okay, yeah. Without the bad ending. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Yeah, minus the bad ending, right? (laughs) Good. Uh, I think there is a a sense that this area, Tampa Bay, has come to its its opportunity to shine. Uh, And I think I can look forward uh, a decade, if you want to look out that far, um, and see Tampa being the biggest city in the state of Florida. Um, Maybe next to the biggest city in the Southeast and rivaling Atlanta, as much as that sounds like a stretch right now, I don't know. Uh, our relative values are strong. The overall economy is strong. Yeah. It doesn't snow here in the wintertime. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, I hope that climate change doesn't include <laughs> snow here in Florida. Yeah, that would be bad. Um, but I think that uh, that forward look certainly will have some bumps in the road. But one of the things that, uh, that we started uh, about five years ago, was a little pet project of mine called FER Analytics. Uh, I'm a bit of a history guy, uh, a bit of a math guy, and all of a real estate guy. Okay. And so where stories and circumstances come together that have all three, history, math, and real estate, I have a keen interest. And so our FER Analytics division, we do all of our own math, all of our own analytics, produce our own opinions so we don't buy this stuff, which you can, and that's fine. There's other people out there pretty smart, but this is a local flavor of what's going on right here. And so our analytics uh, division produces monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly work product for our agents and for our clients' understanding and benefit. And part of that is taking a historical look. We call it the bubble monitor. So we're tracking uh, real data from uh, late 1950s, about as far back as I could get it that I thought was reliable at all. 
uh, all the way up to present, looking at the average rate of appreciation and where the market's really performing. And uh, we developed a product called a bubble monitor, which uh, is kind of an early warning system, if you will. And if we would have had this bubble monitor in 04, we would have said, hmm, if we would have had it in 05, we would have said, whoa. If we would have had it in early 06, we would have said, stop the madness. Uh, we were so far off the fundamentals, that 07 to 11 crash had to happen. Entirely predictable, assuming you're paying attention. Right. So I stood up in front of my whole company. I said, I'll never let that happen again without us knowing it's happening while it's happening. And so kind of goes to your question. Are we in line right now with rate of appreciation historically? Yes. Uh, we have a slack of inventory, certainly, as there are in big parts of the country, except in the higher in the marketplace. Let's just say over a million. Yeah. Um, do we have strong buy side demand? Absolutely. Any reason to think it's going to slow down? I don't think so. And the other part is the relative value. Uh, our current average price is under the U.S. average, under the Florida average. Wow. And so much like when I came here, Florida real estate was cheap. Even relative to Dayton, Ohio, where a guy from Dayton could sell a house there and realistically come to Florida and buy something similar for that same amount of money. Because we looked at, my wife and I looked at California. It was just entirely too expensive. Yeah. Blue skies and sunshine, but way too expensive. Relative value, way out of whack. The interesting part about it is, is that 32 years after we moved here, our rel relative value is back fully in line. And it makes us a very attractive destination, both for corporate relocations, big moves, and the voluntary kind like I did, yeah. uh, where we just decided we're not living there anymore, where we're going to go. And then real estate attractively priced is a big part of that. And so I see us very, very well positioned for a, uh, for a continuing long run. We're currently 98 months into our expansion cycle, which um, is on the outside edge of it. But we've also simmered down some from that 6 and 7 and 8% or in 13, 14, 15, double digit rates of appreciation. Yeah. That was largely recapture of the overcorrection from the Great Recession. Right. Uh, and we watch it very closely. I can tell you as of the end of the third quarter, we'll do our fourth quarter here in the next couple of weeks, the end of the third quarter of 2019, the median price in single family residential real estate in the Tampa Bay area was within a half a percent of a six decade average of where it should be. So we were right in line and set up, I think, for a continuing, uh, run in the overall economic expansion and certainly from a real estate perspective. Pretty excited about it, actually. Awesome. A lot of good things happening. I was told you were a numbers guy. So I am <laughs> a bit of a numbers guy, question, right? Yeah. Look, I'm going to wrap this up with the same question I've asked every guest since guest one, and that is, what if you had one piece of advice you could give a new agent just starting, what would it be? Wow, one piece of advice is going to come in about three parts, so hopefully <laughs> i got a couple of minutes left. All right, you do. Um, certainly who you associate with is key. Who as in the brokerage company, do they have a teaching training and coaching program that is robust, timely, up to date, topical, focused on what you need to know to provide value to your clients. I think they need to have a reputation for high quality work and fair play and honest dealing. And thirdly, I think that company needs to have a culture of sharing and collaboration and encouragement and support. But see, those things are all what the company has and can bring. And certainly a new agent, a new licensee should be looking for those things and should check them and test them and make sure that that company can deliver. But the most important part, and this is where the advice comes in, right? Is not so much what does a company have, but what can you bring as the agent? What are you going to bring? And I would tell you over my years of looking at it and observing those who make it very successful, those who never really got started and all of them in between, I think it comes down to two words, commitment and discipline. Commitment, first of all, to this profession, commitment to career long learning, 
commitment to excellent work and drive and value ever greater amounts of value to your client base. Commitment, but a commitment without discipline, the actual do something about it because one is just words and the other one's action. Yeah. And so, um, you might remember the first habit of highly effective people, Dr. Covey's pretty famous study. The first habit was to be proactive, right? Is to actually do something. And that discipline focused on a commitment to something in particular, like the real estate profession, will take you a long way. And if you affiliate or associate with the right brokerage company and the right people who are in that company, that combination is a successful combo. As we, as we might say in Ohio, that'll have you cooking with gas. <laughs> I'll, ask, I'll ask some Ohio friends about that. Um, well, you can just, you can just Google that if you want, That's true, Doug. I will. Doug, if somebody wants to reach out to you directly, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, easy. Uh, certainly happy to chat with anybody, that any of your listeners that might want to challenge me or call me a crazy man uh, or just uh, ask a question. You can certainly reach me by email at Doug at FloridaExecutiveRealty.com. Uh, and my office number here in Tampa is 813-972-3430. I'll be happy to uh, respond in either way and chat with any of your listeners who uh, listened and enjoyed the podcast. Doug, I can't thank you enough. It's been wonderful sitting here and, and getting some of this information from you. Uh, your local knowledge is, is, um, is second to none. It's been really cool. Thank you so much for your time. Well, Bill, thanks for the opportunity. And thanks again to uh, Anthony Malafronte, right? Anthony was uh, kind enough to suggest to me, by the way, on a couple of occasions, you got to talk to Bill, you got to talk to Bill. And uh, sure enough, Bill came to our office and did a uh, a presentation on a, a piece of software, Remind, uh, to help our agents just as a, uh, as a courtesy to us. And so, Bill, thank you for that. And thank you for the opportunity to be on your podcast. I enjoyed it as well.